such a troublemaker. I'm Thank so you. glad you reminded me because I almost forgot. God bless your little heart. <laughs> you did your, you hey, did sir. Your, good to see you. I hope you're glad to see you guys. Hi, Dave. Hey, Eric. I'm so sorry about your loss. I know it's been a rough few weeks. And, thank you. Uh, yeah, hey, thanks. You guys will have to uh, Zoom me personally. We can chat about uh, the challenges of parental care. So, oh, but anyway, great. is mine. Well, I hear you're doing a talk on depression next week. Is that right? Um, <laughs> you know what? That would be a good talk, honestly. I really should do that topic. I just, uh, that, no, that is an excellent topic, honestly. I, I, I should find someone who's a specialist in that area and bring them on as a guest. I really should. No, it is it's a great topic. idea. Yeah, okay. Now with COVID, it's insane. It's yeah, I know. Hurdles. Well, hopefully we'll be a little encouraged tonight. That's why I felt compelled to do this topic. So maybe it'll get, we'll get a little, a little encouragement tonight. But um, yeah, that would be a good topic. You're right. I should do that. Uh, thank you for Thanks, reminding Eric. me. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. But I will contact you personally. Uh, maybe we can chat awesome. personally. All right. Let me meet thank you me. guys. All right. So there we go. Okay. All right, well, it's good to see everyone. Like I said, uh, my name is Eric Chabot. I am the uh, director of a couple of apologetic ministries here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, obviously, we weren't able to meet on site last year because of COVID. We, of course, did, still did a lot of our ministry with the evangelism, as some of you know, you get my emails. So there still is a lot to happen. We just couldn't, we had to switch our Zoom calls to, uh, we had to switch our on site meetings to Zoom and then. CJF uh, ended up, um, you know, inviting other people, whoever wanted to come on across the country. Of course, COVID was here and everyone needed a lot of encouragement and fellowship and just, you know, community. So we thought it was good to reach out and uh, have anybody uh, welcome uh, to participate, you know, in these calls. And so I hope that, I assume you're going to uh, hopefully, um, you know, some of you have been here already, you know, the format. Sometimes I have guests on, which I will next week and this other, this month we have some upcoming guests. But then sometimes I just do the call myself. Um, I'll just do a topic and then we'll talk about it afterwards. But, um, and then these are all recorded. Uh, they're all recorded. They'll go up on my YouTube channel and you guys can watch it. I'll send out the PDF and then you guys can follow on if you want. So whatever you miss, don't worry about it. It's always recorded. But uh, why don't we have a word of prayer? Uh, Lord, we just thank you for, thank you for this night, God. Thank you for a new year. Lord, it's, uh, you know, new year brings, you know, anticipation of things. It also brings maybe some apathy. It brings some some challenges, of course, you know, um, you know, just getting motivated and thinking about what we want to do this year. And it's just, it's always sometimes challenging to transition the beginning of the year, but it's what it is. It is a new year. So um, we just pray tonight that we would be um, encouraged. We pray, God, that we see that you're working in our lives, no matter what, how may we, we may feel. And I just pray, Lord God, that you'd be with each every person here. I pray your spirit would do his work in each one of us and that he be present in this discussion. And I just pray, God, that you'd encourage people tonight as well. You know, Lord, last year was very challenging. And some of those same challenges have transitioned over into this year. I just pray, God, that we'd be able to see you in the midst of everything. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, once again, great to see everyone. Um, I thought that what we do tonight. So I'm about to share the screen here is um, something on God's will for your uh, life this year. Um, go up here, scroll up here a ways. So, you know, I've actually done this topic uh, on campus because obviously when you're dealing with college students, they struggle with this, this topic a lot with uh, the, the, the difficult decisions they're about to make in their lives, career and marriage and all those kinds of issues relationships but the reality of it is all of us have the same issues so <laughs> some of these issues are just as applicable to us no matter what age you're at and i've also noticed on some of the calls over the weeks when we're having a discussion time that people ask a lot of questions about god's will about specific issues you know they seem to come up a lot and so i could see this topic coming at some point so i thought the first week even though we're geared towards apologetics and the deep, he heavy topics, uh, which we will do, we, I thought that we'd just do something a little more practical tonight um, with this topic and uh, kind of start a year off this way. So um, don't worry, next week we'll get right back into um, something apologetically inclined. I have a guest coming on to talk about a, a really cool book he wrote, um, but I'll send you the email for it next week. So we do have some good guests coming up. I've been working on them. I've been emailing guests. I've been talking to them. So we have a lot of people in the works, um, some really cool stuff coming up. So just be patient, excited. So um, we'll have some 
really cool topics uh, in the upcoming weeks. Okay. Well, as I said, I thought that we would do uh, God's Will for Your Life in 2021. Um, the reality of it is that as, you're, as I finish up here with this, when we're done, I think you will see that a lot of the things I talk about tonight are actually were the same thing, uh, God's Will for You in 2020 and God's Will for You in 2019 and 2018 and every year of your life, because a lot of things we'll talk about tonight have already been talked about in the Bible. So um, if you're looking for a specific vision tonight, like God has a specific vision for your life this year, I, I can't give that to you. Um, that wasn't my goal anyways, because I think sometimes we, you know, look for something new uh, for God to do each year um, when all, a lot of times all God's trying to do what he's always done. And that is uh, done what he's laid out in scriptures, what he's been trying to do in our lives. And it's the question is whether we'll cooperate with him. <laughs> So I just want to mention one thing that um, there are a slew of books that have been written on God's will. I mean, I couldn't even keep them all on any of the slides. I mean, we I, there's so many I couldn't put them all up here. But those are some good starting points. If you want to go deeper on this topic, I've read a lot of books on it. Um, you know, these are all good. They all have different, pers I mean, some of the same perspectives, but, you know, maybe a little different here and there. But uh, the shortest one here is just do something. Notice that book there says just do something liberating approach to finding God's will for your life uh, how to make a decision without dreams visions fleeces impressions open doors random hunches casting lots all those things that we try to do to find God very God's very special will in our life because you know we're terrified and unless we know exactly what to do we're gonna make a mistake um, of course God sees our heart so just remember that uh, these books are all good if you want to go deeper on the topic um, so one thing I've noticed um, is that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we are so interested in this topic are those that maybe some of you on here just don't even care that much about this, haven't thought about it much. I don't know. I don't know how much you've read about it or how much it's been discussed in your circles because you all are from different backgrounds. You're all in different parts of the country. But, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we we focus in on God's will for our lives because we really do want to control our life. Um, we want a lot of security. You know, we want almost perfect security in some ways. We want to know our job's going to last forever. We want to know that retirement's going to kick in. We want to know we're going to be taken care of. We want, we want perfect health. You know, we want to know where our health's going to be. We want to know this or know that. So, you know, it's just part of who we are as humans. We're just wired that way. Um, sometimes, of course, we are afraid to make a mistake. You know, what happens if we make the wrong decision? Our life's ruined. God can't use us. Uh, may perhaps he's done with us or perhaps, you know, it's going to shipwreck a certain number of years of, of our lives. And so we live in a lot of fear. Or uh, maybe we think it's very spiritual to see God directing every single detail of our lives. That he is, has his hand on every single detail. And that means we have a super close, intimate relationship with God. Now, there's nothing wrong with intimacy with God, and, and sometimes he does guide us in the details, but the point is that some of us, you know, tend to, um, you know, be a, a little over-obsessive on God's will, I think, but, you know, as we go into 2021, I do know for a fact that, at least I hope, that most of us want to use our time well. You know, time is a gift that God gives us, and if you're healthy and you can do things, or maybe if you are restricted, the point is, no matter what's going on, God wants us to be good stewards of our time. Now, I have a couple of proof texts here because I, you know, I don't mean to quote out of context. You know, I'm down on that as I talked about just taking verses out of context and making a whole theology out of them. But, you know, some of the passages people quote are these. Um, so we all want to use our time well. I think we, it's pretty safe to say we don't want to waste time this year. And if you look at you know, how we are going to spend our time this year it really revolves around some of these questions. You know, what, what do we love? What, what really drives us? Um, you know, what do we want to imitate? Who or what do we want to imitate? Or where are our loyalties? Um, where do you want to commit your time and energy? That'll flow from those three questions. And what are you aiming towards? And what do you value? It's a great question. I heard Sean McDowell ask that recently. You know, what He'll be on our show actually in about two weeks, by the way. Uh, what do I value? You know, what are my, what do I really value? What you value is what you're going to pour your time into. 
Um, I talked talk to my 13 year old son the other day about trying to get him motivated to learn the scriptures. Sometimes he's just not motivated. You know, he's like, God, dad, you know, it's kind of, I know I'm supposed to do it, but you know, it's just hard sometimes, you know, it's kind of hard to get motivated. And I had to bring up this issue of, you know, you think about what you value. Do you value knowing God? Do you value his word? Do you value getting to know him in a greater way, you know, and you have to get in the scriptures to do that. So these are good questions to ask for this upcoming year. Um, that will determine a lot of times how you spend your time. I, last night I was watching about 10 o'clock at night, as I always do, trying to settle down and I get distracted. And of course I turned on the TV for a minute and uh, the Avengers Endgame was on, which I've already seen like twice. I thought to myself, okay, am I gonna waste another an hour watching this, which is a great movie. And I, I, I just, I could watch it over and over again, but thought to myself, you know, that that's just not a good use of my time. I mean, I've already seen it kind of just wasting time. So, um, you know, I had to ask myself that question, you know, and uh, whether I wanted to do that. And um, so these are things you have to think about this year. Um, now, once again, this year, just as last year and every year, is that you will be fighting a spiritual battle this year, just like we do every year. If you came to know the Lord and you're in the faith and you know the Lord and the Holy Spirit's in you, then you're going to be, you're in enemy territory. And we know this passage well, the Ephesians 6 text. I'm sure most of us know it. Um, it applies to us every day and applies to us every day this new year. Um, we're going to have a battle ahead of us, okay? And like Daryl Bach said when he was on the show about six months or two or three months ago, Remember when it comes to people, you're dealing with people out there when they don't agree with you, whether it be politically or socially or whatever it is, you're not fighting um, people. We don't fight against people. We fight against, a, we fight a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle is where the battle really is. It's not against people, okay? We don't wrestle against people. We wrestle against flesh and blood. Um, so the question is, are you going to wrestle against people all year this year and, and fight all these battles, you know, you know, going on and on about who's evil and that person's evil, which I'm not doubting evil exists, but you have to realize we're fighting a spiritual battle. And that's where we need to be praying, praying a lot and really taking our battle to the Lord, okay? Um, for the hearts and souls of people, just the way they think, these worldviews and mindsets, they don't know any better. I mean, every day you could turn on the news, you just sit there and you go, did that just happen? I mean, did that really just happen? Did that person say that? Did that really happen? I mean, it's mind boggling. So that's only going to happen more and more. Okay. And so we need to realize that we're going to be fighting a battle this year. And that means also that I read this book a ways back. I'm just mentioning this, this, this book by John Piper, um, whether you agree with him on everything or not, I don't care. That's not the point. Um, the point is that he has a really good point or a good book called when I don't desire God, how to fight for joy. And he talks about in this book, by the way, you can get this book online for free. He has all his books in PDF. Go to his website. You can download it for free. He, he have, it makes all his books available for PDFs. But, you know, he says here in this book, I remember reading it, that fighting, we have to fight for prayer and fight to be in the word and fight to share our faith because it's a spiritual battle. Like, it's not like God just zaps us all day long, like, oh, pray. Oh, you feel good today about prayer. Oh, you feel good about reading the word. Oh, you feel this way or that way. No, most of us have to be motivated and we need God's grace in our lives. And we need, we're fighting a battle. And, you know, the fight for joy is there to be joyful in the Lord. You know, of course, that's a fruit of the spirit, one of the fruits. But it's not something that comes easy. It takes work and it takes our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. So you're going to be in a battle this year, once again, fighting for a strong prayer life, fighting to be in the word, fighting to share your faith, fighting, fighting with God's help, okay? Um, and that's okay. Tomorrow morning, I'll get up and I'll say to myself, okay, am I gonna go pray now? Or am I gonna be sit here and start getting distracted on my phone? Am I gonna start picking up my phone and answering texts? Do I, do I go to God in prayer first and start my day off correctly, giving him the honor and glory that he deserves, giving him you know, putting my day into his hands and confessing my dependency upon him, giving him my full attention. Okay. So that's something that's going to be happening this year. It happens every year, happens every day. Okay. Um, all right. Just some of those are some of the basics of things for this coming year. 
Um, one thing I did want to mention also, if I can, I think I have to skip ahead here. I'll go back. Oh, yeah. Um, one thing that I just want to uh, mention about disagreement fatigue. I think we saw a lot of this last year. Um, I think some of us maybe just got burnt out. I mean, I got burnt out at one point. Um, after April, when COVID came around, all the debates about COVID, I just punted out. I said, I'm not going to debate COVID. I'm just, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of debating masks and, you know, lockdowns and what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And I just absolutely got burnt out for about two or three months. And I just stopped debating it, um, at least online, the media, which is the worst place to debate it. So, and then of course we had the racial tensions. We had a lot of debates about that. Then we had debates about the election. And a lot of us just got burnt out, you know, and a lot of us are still burnt out. So, but the question also becomes, you know, in 2021, as we go into 2021, whether, you know, we, we obviously in some cases we're, we're hesitant to speak up when we need to speak up, okay? And so we need to ask ourselves this year, if God wants us to speak up, will we do it? Now, if he does, if there's, you know, there's a period where you don't need to, that's fine. But I'm just saying, don't let the fatigue uh, scare you. Like, you know, I can't say anything anymore. I'm scared. It's so hostile out there. I don't want to say anything about my faith. I want to talk about God. I want to talk about my worldview. You have to realize that God is with you and the spirit is with you. And people are seeking. They're seeking the truth. They're seeking, you know, they're spiritually hungry. We had a great year on campus last fall. Some of you know about that. The hungriest I've ever seen people in my life for spiritual things over all the years we've done it. So, you you know, just don't don't punt out of it completely because I know maybe you're burnt out. Remember that you have the spirit in you and he can give you the boldness to speak up if there's an opportunity. And um, so let's be uh, careful not to fall into the privatization of our faith where we just punt out of everything and are just sitting around waiting for Jesus to come back. It may be a time that, you know, this is the time we need to be speaking up um, at certain points. So just, just, be nice, just be discerning, you know, about that issue, okay? All right, let me go back here because I had to skip ahead here. So um, one thing for sure is that, excuse me, when it comes to knowing the, mor the, the will of God, um, the moral will of God, is already revealed in the Bible. That means that it's already revealed in the scriptures. And it means 100% of what God wants you to know about how to please him and what to do has already been revealed, okay? Um, you don't need to pray about, you know, if you're violating a moral principle in scripture and you're asking what God's will is in it, then there's no need to really pray about it. So for example, if this is just an extreme example, if someone comes to you tomorrow and says, hey, I've got a good job opportunity for you, Eric. You can work part-time. Uh, at a strip club down the street making 30 bucks an hour. I mean, I'm just being very extreme here. But the point is that, of course, I don't need to pray about that. It's ridiculous. It's not God's will. It's out of his will already. And so it's just silly to even, well, what should I do? Should I go get counsel? Or I need to pray about this. Or maybe I need to seek a specific leading. No, you don't need to. Okay? It's already, I'm already, I would be violating the moral will of God. Okay? Which is in the scriptures. All right? And so a lot of things that God has already told us to do are in the scriptures. It's God's will for us every year, these same things day after day, year after year, meaning that Jesus has commanded, just some examples, Jesus has commanded us to share our faith and make disciples. You know, we're commanded to abstain from sexual immorality. There's three things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 here, uh, number three here, we're supposed to rejoice always, give thanks, pray at all times. Um, we're supposed to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Always pray in the spirit, Ephesians 6, 18. We're supposed to promote unity among our brothers and sisters, John 17. We're all being conformed to the image of Jesus. That's God's overall desire for all our lives. If you want to ask him what his overall will for your life is this year, it's to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's what it is every year, okay? To be conformed to the image of his son. Um, no different than it for any other believer. And, you know, God, of course, wants us to know him and know his son, Messiah, so that uh, Jesus, that we can experience eternal life, uh, that quality of life right now, as Jesus talked about in John 17, 3. Of course, we're called to avoid the deeds of the flesh and experience the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5. 
you can't live out anything in the uh, this year. You can't live out your faith at all if you don't know the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's talked about heavily in John 14, 16, other passages as well. And of course, we're commanded to know what we believe and why we believe, and we're supposed to be able to give a reason for the hope that is within us, 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16. Those are just some of the things that God's already revealed in the scriptures that we're supposed to do, okay? His moral will. I struggle just to even do these on a regular basis. I don't know about the rest of you, so we've got plenty to do as it is, okay, versus me looking for some perfect, you know, uh, leading in my life. I mean, I have a hard time appropriating these, these commands already, okay, and there's many more, as you know. All right, so um, let's uh, move on here. I talked about disagreement fatigue. Uh, one thing that um, I have noticed is that uh, this issue of uh, God's guidance, it is true that you know, if God, you know, we say like, if God can guide us, does he want to guide us? Does he promise to do so? Which he has, he does promise to guide us and he does guide us. But sometimes we fail to uh, get the directions and follow them at times. Of course, I talked about things are already in the Bible. So if, if you're praying for something that's already been revealed in the scriptures, then you're kind of wasting your time. You just need to do what the text says, right? Which can be hard enough as it is. But, you know, sometimes we may be ignorant of what the text says, the Bible says, like in number one, we may be just be, we may be violating a scriptural principle and not know it. Um, in some cases, we may know what we're supposed to do in certain situations, but sometimes we're just not willing to obey God because we want our way. And if that's the case, God's under no obligation to, to lead and guide us in a certain way if we don't want to do it. If we're just going to sit there and be like, well, I know what, maybe God wants me to do something I don't want to do, so I'm just going to. I'm just going to sit back and uh, not going to do it anyway. Well, I mean, God's not obligated to guide you at all if you're not even willing to obey him, right? Um, and uh, sometimes we just uh, know what God wants to do, but we're afraid to do it because we don't trust him. And if you don't know him, you can't trust him. You can't trust him when you don't know, okay? Now, it's interesting that um, in this book, uh, Finding the Will of God by this author, um, it's kind of interesting. He says this here. What does it mean to find God's will? He says, to find God's will, the verb to find means to learn, obtain, or attain God's mind. But the term implies that God's mind is something hidden that needs to be discovered. The term for trying to find a divine being's hidden knowledge is divination. Thus, finding in this use really means divination, which according to Merriam-Webster is the art of practice that seeks to discover hidden knowledge, usually by the interpretation of omens or by aid of supernatural powers divination was common in pagan religions. And so I think that a lot of times when we ask for wisdom from God, we sometimes are looking for some sort of, you know, we think God's got something knowledge that we just don't know. You know, we want to see it from his perspective. That's what wisdom is, seeing it from his perspective. Um, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, as I just said, the, the wisdom's already in the Bible. Not everything, as I'll talk about in a minute, but you know, just remember, it, it, we don't want to be like so, looking for some sort of secret, secret hidden knowledge, okay? Um, that gets a little weird. Just, uh, just, just be aware of that. But I think that most of us know that most of us don't pray about, or I assume we don't. I assume we use good judgment with some of these common things. You know, I don't, when I get up in the morning, pray about or talk to God what I'm going to wear or, you know, what I'm going to have for lunch or how I get to work or, you know, where should some of these basic things, where should I buy gas or, you know, when should I have devotional times or what cologne to wear? I stopped wearing cologne a while ago anyway. But the point is that there's a lot of basic things, you know, we don't pray about. I know that we, you know, should I go to, uh, you know, or just, just basic things. I assume that we're not that spiritual asking God for every single detail to tell us. Um, but these big decisions that are not in the Bible, like on the other side, um, you know, the Bible doesn't specify these. It doesn't specify specifically here you're supposed to marry. Of course, you're supposed to marry a believer. Um, it doesn't tell you, you know, what school to go to, what career to pick, what car to buy. There's a lot of things that the Bible is specific about. So as I said, it reveals the moral will of God, general guidelines. And then, uh, you know, that's, that's really about it. Um, it doesn't necessarily reveal every single detail of our lives. Of course it doesn't. Um, so... The, the four distinctive ways sometimes, as I say, God guides us is obviously moral guidance. That's, that's through scripture. I mean, it's right there. You don't need to make it so complicated. Um, 
Sometimes, you know, it comes to wisdom where there's no command in scripture, meaning that scripture doesn't speak to that area. Sometimes God just gives us the freedom to make the choice. I'll give you an example. My family right now is looking for a house. Um, we've looked at several houses. We're, we're gathering all the information. We're getting all the details. We're doing our homework, working hard, cognitively, using our, our minds, using the best judgment, making, using common sense, putting together all the, 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 the information. I mean, God could guide us to a specific house. If he wants to, I pray about it. But the point is that I think that he gives us the freedom to uh, make a decision once we gather the correct information. Um, and, and, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says, Eric, you and your family are supposed to live at this specific house in this specific street, in this specific neighborhood. Obviously, it doesn't say that anywhere. So, um, you know, I think that God gives us freedom to make a good decision using sound judgment, okay? And that's godly. That's a godly thing to do. God gave us a mind. We're supposed to use it. He doesn't want us to be silly and not use common sense. It doesn't glorify him. It's not, it's silly for me to, uh, you know, just not gather all the information, rather just have God tell me what to do every time. I mean, where, how am I not using, how, how would that be using my mind? It's lazy, okay? Um, and then there's sovereign guidance where God certainly guides us by, in our lives, he's working out all the events together, whether we make mistakes, whether we make the right choices, he's weaving it all together to conform us to the image of Jesus. He's going to use it for his good. Um, if we make a bad choice, we have to face the consequences, but he will weave that into his plan for our life, okay? And he will, he'll steer it in the direction it needs to go, okay? And then in some cases, we need special guidance. That's where there's some things, as I said, are not revealed in the Bible. Um, and God can do that if he wants to, and he has a, there's a need there. Um, he can guide us a specific way, a special way, but he doesn't always do that. In many cases, he doesn't. Um, in many cases, it's going to be wisdom guidance where, you know, I can tell you stories of people that pray and pray and seek counsel and read the Bible. They're godly people. And God never guided them supernaturally exactly what to do. They just had to eventually just make a decision. They had to just make the decision. They, they gathered all the information. And they said, you know what? This is the direction we're going. We prayed about it. And there's nothing morally wrong with it. it, does it it's not violating a principle of scripture. And you know, that's it. Um, now, as I said, someone is not muted. Why are they not muted? Um, please mute yourself if you're not muted. Um, as I said, sometimes people can get special guidance. I'm not saying God can't do that. I would never restrict God. He's done it in my life sometimes, but not in many cases he hasn't. Okay. And so just need to remember that. All right. And then, um, of course, as I just said, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us who we should marry. But of course, if the person isn't a believer, um, you're already violating a moral principle. So you don't need to like pray about it for two months. Should I marry this person? You know, they don't know the Lord, but I'm going to pray about it anyway. That's stupid. You don't need to pray about it, okay? Um, if they're not in the faith, you've already, you're, you're kind of stepped out of God's will, okay? You're already out of God's will, all right? Um, or which job to take? You know, God, probably, you, let's say you have three uh, job um, interviews in two days, um, and they're all within God's moral will. You're not violating, you know, whether... Now, like I said, you're offered a job at a strip club. That's probably a violation of God's moral will. But in some cases, you just have to make a decision and make the best judgment, okay? Um, have one to three children or more children. Obviously, sometimes you have to use common sense. I mean, can I afford it? Well, I'll just step out and trust God. Well, you can, but I think God would still want you to think about that. If you can't provide for them, it's probably not the greatest idea, but do what you want. Um, or buy a house. Well, can you afford a house? Well, think about it. Use your head. Um, obviously, if a church is heretical, um, you don't need to pray about that church. If they're obviously teaching false doctrine, the answer would be probably not to go to that church. So sometimes we make it more complicated uh, than it needs to be. Okay. Now, most people, I would say, are discipled in what I call the traditional view of guidance, where they think these things all line up. And when they all line up, you kind of found God's will, meaning if circumstances look a certain way um, and the Bible lines up, 
you know, uh, with one and two, um, you know, that God has to tell you what to do that confirms the circumstances. And then you take counsel, then you have peace about it. All these things come together. It's like a big package. And then once you've got it all, you found God's will. Um, the reality of it is that uh, I think most of us, at least my experience talking to other people in my own life as well, um, circumstances sometimes are just confusing. And sometimes, of course, that's all you can go by is circumstances. That's all you got. I mean, you know, it's like this is this door's open here or, you know, this is what's happening. I mean, I guess I have to make this decision. This is what's happening. Um, so sometimes this, this uh, view is a little tricky as far as trying to use a traditional model. And sometimes you don't have time. You don't have time to make a decision. You can't wait months and months, okay? Sometimes you have to make a decision quickly. So what I call the principle of freedom, um, as I said, where there's no command in scripture, God gives you the freedom to choose. And that means that the principle asserts that there's some decisions which have multiple options, any number of which may be acceptable to God. Like if you have four or five job offers, you may need to just pick one. Um, you don't even have time even, you have to pick one immediately. Um, but I say, as I say, the final decision can't violate God's moral will, um, obviously, okay? But what about this one, as I said, a lot of people, you know, it comes to making decisions, they pray about it, they're in community, they're walking with the Lord, they're in the word of God, they maybe even take counsel, and they still don't know what to do, where they're just like, gosh, man, I really got to make a big decision, and I just don't know what to do. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I need to know what to do here. It's tough, because I don't want to make a mistake. Okay, this is a big decision I'm making, huge decision. And that is where, as I say, actually, as Gary Friesen says, this book, Decision Making the Will of God, you could read it. He would say, and I would agree, that you have freedom to make a decision. Okay, you have to make a decision. All right. You could be waiting back here. You could be waiting for months and months and months if you're waiting for God to tell you specifically what to do. Maybe you won't. Maybe, you know, maybe he, maybe he, you know, guide you in some way where you know what to do. Um, I can tell you all kinds of stories that people thought that God told them to do something, um, and it turned out that was not God speaking to them. Um, and there's not, as I'll talk about in a minute, there's nothing the Bible says that has to be the way, you know, for you to get guidance every time, okay? So, um, as I said, just to repeat, you know, the principle of wisdom is if God is not going to dictate every choice you make, you are free to choose. Um, and if there's not a commandment in scripture that says anything about it, then you have to make the spiritual decision with the best ends in view. And it has to be governed by the moral will of God from scripture, okay? Um, remember though, this is what wisdom is. Wisdom is accurately defined as the power to see and the inclination to choose the best and highest goal together with the surest means of attaining it. Wisdom is the ability to recognize what's spiritually profitable in a given situation. And so the question is where sometimes people go wrong in applying wisdom, all right? Um, and as I said, I think sometimes they go wrong in, uh, you know, thinking that God has to guide them, um, you know, specifically in a detail every single time, whereas a lot of times they just have freedom to make that decision, okay? Um, and that's what happens sometimes. Okay, let me mention something about counsel too, um, getting counsel. Um, yeah, you can go run and get counsel and have people try to guide you in your life. Um, that can be challenging. Um, sometimes counsel is fallible. In many cases, of course, these are just people. Um, they're not, you know, they're not God. They're just humans. Um, it's true older people and some people have life experience can give you good counsel. They've been through the situation. Um, sometimes, if you take counsel from several people and get confusing, um, there may be someone who says, you know, remember that you're the one that always has to make the end decision. And so you really can't blame the person who maybe gave you some counsel. Okay. You can't go back to them and say, you told me to do this. No. In the end of the day, <clears throat> you're the one that made the decision. Right. Um, and you should be maturing in your faith. I say this number five, you should be maturing enough. So you don't always have to run to somebody and ask them what to do. Um, you know, you should be hopefully reaching the point where you have good discernment and you've built your knowledge of the scriptures. You're able to discern good from evil, right from wrong. You know, you're able to make good choices. Um, and then of course, you know, some people when it comes to counsel may tell you what you want to hear. Uh, that, that goes, that happens too, where, you know, a good counselor always tells you what you need to hear. 
remember, if you go to someone for counsel, say to them, I, I need to hear what I need. Tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Okay. Um, that's a sign of a good friend. Okay. Now, there's a big question today. Um, it's a mixed bag in Christian circles. Um, you know, wh what people believe about this, different views on it. Um, I will say, uh, if you're going to pray for wisdom and, and you're going to be seeking to hear the still vo voice of God, or you're trying to, God's going to tell you what to do, I don't know, audibly or an impression or whatever it is, um, it could cripple you for a while because you may not ever hear anything. And, uh, and the, further, the, the other thing is that it's a little tricky sometimes knowing what voice you're hearing. Um, there's, I know plenty of Christians that are godly people, never heard any voices. And uh, the other problem is, is kind of like what it says right here. As uh, the quote says right here, how can you tell whether these voices are from God or from some other source? As uh, Friesen says, he says, this is a critical question for impressions could be produced by any number of sources, God, Satan, an angel, a demon, human emotions such as fear, ecstasy, hormonal imbalance, insomnia, medication, upset stomach, simple impressions, temptations, may be exposed to what they are, but the spirit sensitized conscience and the word of God. But beyond that, one encounters a subjective quagmire of uncertainty, tremendous frustration experienced by sincere Christians earnestly, but fruitlessly sought to decipher the code of the inward witness. And he is correct. Um, very tricky. Okay. Now, um, so it's a little challenge. It's challenging when you're only relying on guidance apart from the word of God, when you want God to constantly guide you without the text. Um, you know, the, it sometimes produces uncertainty. It creates confusion. Um, there's no objective source for it. You know, it's just, uh, you have no way to test it. <clears throat> and so it's, it's, a little, it's a little tricky, okay? Now, I'm not saying he can't do that. I'm not saying God can't guide you apart from the scriptures. He can do whatever he wants to do. But the point is that you need to be very discerning. And uh, it, it gets a little, it can be kind of confusing sometimes. And nobody, I don't, I've never believed anybody is that spiritual that they can tell me that they know when God's talking to them every single time, they know it's the voice of God. I don't believe it because I've never seen it. And I know people that believe that are misguided because I've seen them say that. And I know it's not God talking to them because the stuff that comes out of their mouths don't make any sense. So anyway, um, so does God guide us through the spirit? The answer is yes, he does. But of course, the spirit speaks primarily through the text, through the Bible. Okay, as I say, number two, yes, God can speak apart from the word, but is not common. And in many cases, it'll cause you to be asking, who is it that's speaking to you? Um, at least a lot of confusion. The Spirit of God, number three, definitely speaks through preaching and teaching. If you're listening to good biblical exegetic sermon, exegetical sermons, God speaks through those sermons. I've had that happen many times in my life. You, know, you turn on the radio or you listen to someone preach, and you're like, God is speaking through that, that message. I can hear him speaking. You know, he's, he's guiding me through that message. So it's important to be hearing good preaching. Um, as I said, for those who say have a perfect track record with God speaking to them, I think you're a very small minority. And of course, many people shipwreck their lives that way. Um, I've seen it happen. Now, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying it does happen, okay? Um, now, one thing that uh, a few other things that come up sometimes, sometimes we get confused about our expectation with God's will. We assume that God is going to unveil his plan all at once like a course syllabus. So, you know, we all we sometimes want everything to be revealed at once, okay? And what God does a lot of times, he gives us, he wants us to take one step here, take a step of faith, and then more light will come later on. But we have to take that first step and obey him, right? Um, we Everything's not revealed at once, very rarely. And, you know, like for number two, you know, if, if I tell God I don't want to go to Japan as a missionary, that's what he'll send me. And so some people view God as a, as a killjoy. You know, that, that's not what God is, okay? He knows what's best for you. He only wants what's best for you because he is wise, okay? Number three, God only reveals his will to people's special callings like ministers and missionaries. Um, not true. Uh, God's vocational call is for every believer. So whatever you do, whatever career God has you in, serve him there faithfully. Um, it's not more spiritual or more a higher calling just to be a missionary or, or pastor, okay? The Bible doesn't teach that, okay? Um, it's not that it's a bad calling. God maybe call people to do that, but 
just because you you know you're a plumber or a lawyer or electrician or a um, a realtor that's just as godly and you're supposed to serve god there faithfully okay and uh of course uh only mature christians can discern god's will not necessarily um that's not necessarily true either um and one thing you know you just want to realize is perhaps we need to you know we reach the point in our spiritual lives where sometimes god wants us to grow up and what i mean by that he doesn't need to tell us every single thing to do like everything we he has to tell us like if my children come to me and they want guidance or wisdom say dad what do you think about that of course i'm going to tell them but i know they're going to reach a point in their lives where they're going to be making decisions without running to me every single time you know they're i'm gonna i'm gonna assume they've grown up to the point and matured where they can make some choices because they have good discernment and they um, have good you know they just are able to do it now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask god for wisdom i'm not saying that but sometimes you know we we just never mature in this area we assume god has to tell us what to do in every single situation and um i don't know if that really leads to a whole lot of maturity um remember also the apostles did not teach us to see god's will through super supernatural means such as waiting to hear god's voice uh gathering hunches or interpreting dreams or signs instead the new testament offers us a program of the father's guidance is based and foremost upon on having a close relationship with jesus through the holy spirit what jesus calls abiding or remaining in him of course when john 15 talks about to abide, it talks about staying close to Jesus, staying close to the Messiah. Abiding means we have to abide in his word. And it's no doubt the closer we are to the Lord, when we're really walking with him, guidance is going to be a lot easier. And we're going to certainly be more discerning. We're going to be able to pick up on things. We're going to be able to test things. And so the key is definitely having a close relationship with God. No doubt about that. I don't dispute that at all. Um, okay. So remember, try with you know we don't want to you know make have these pitfalls where we don't think we don't use our head or we don't think ahead or we don't know ourselves um god does not take any glory from us when we don't think and we don't use the god-given mind he's given us to make choices okay there's no glory um to god when we we just are silly and try to not use common sense okay um and of course, you guys probably know, even if you think you found God's will in certain situations, it doesn't always mean you're going to avoid trouble or struggle. That does not the way it works. You can look at the life of Jesus. You can look at the life of James or, you know, read First Peter. Uh, many people struggle uh, and find hardship in the middle of God's will. Okay, so just because you made a decision and it becomes challenging, it doesn't always mean you're out of God's will. Okay, so if you're saying, well, it should be easy not necessarily okay not necessarily okay that's just um something that happens sometimes and uh remember that oh, i'm gonna skip that one um i do believe in a lot of cases that uh i don't believe in the what we call the dot theory whereas uh we have to find the one thing in life whether it be one spouse or one vocation i think in many cases uh there can be more than one option out there so that's a very westernized construct as far as like finding the perfect soulmate um that's not really biblical i should say it's more of a western construct um and there's not one vocation to pick from you may just have to pick something and go do it you know a certain career um get a skill and go do it um maybe you're good at art or you know being an artist i don't have an artistic bone in my body um, but some people are amazing artists. They, that's just something God's gifted them, and they're using that, that gift, okay, that skill. Okay, and then uh, one last thing. Um, what happens if you make a mistake? What happens if you make a mistake in your decision-making? Like you miss God's will, or you made a bad decision, you thought you heard the voice of God and it wasn't God, or you thought that you prayed about it and sought God's will and you made the choice and it wasn't right, turned out it was a mistake. Well, as I said, God's sovereign will is going to be fulfilled in your life no matter what. And that means he will use whatever you do in your life to lead to his, his glory. Um, he'll definitely weave it into his plan for your life, as I said. Yes, if you willfully disobey him, you'll face the consequences. It may lead to emotional loss or other kinds of losses. You will face that, that consequence. That's the way disobedience works. If you're ignorant um, and you're ignorant, you made a bad decision, you're ignorant. 
I mean, you may have made a decision because you're ignorant of the word of God or what God says. That can happen. Um, you know, if you thought you heard God tell you to do something and later found out it wasn't God, you have to rethink your process. Um, but the point is that for 2021, as I said back here, once again, we need to remember a lot of these things have already been revealed in scripture and we are just called to carry these out through the work of the spirit helping us. Um, there may be something in the Bible that really you want to focus on this year. Like, you know, I need to pray at all times in the spirit. I need to work on praying more. I need to pray when I'm in my car. I need to pray when I'm walking. I need to pray through things. I need to not try to, you know, take on something without praying about it first, bathe it in prayer. Or maybe, Maybe this year you're, you need to disciple someone. Maybe some of you have never discipled anybody in your life. You've never, you know, invested in someone's life or you sat them down, went through the scriptures or taught them what you know about the scriptures or talked about your faith or and poured into somebody else. Um, maybe you need to follow Jesus' command and try to commit to making a disciple this year or working in someone's life to help build them up as a disciple. I don't know. Um, perhaps you know, it has to do with um, watching what you say, or what you do online, things you say and what you do, you know, um, you know, maybe you need to, there's a fruit of the spirit this year that you want to focus on, like you want to focus on joy, you want to focus on being more patient, you want to focus on being more loving, you know, you want to uh, focus on being more self-controlled, maybe that's something that, you know, it's, it's, it's a this year you want to really hone in on. Um, or maybe you want to focus on number 11, being on every Zoom call this week, because you want to know what you believe and why you believe, and be able to give a reason for the hope that is within you. And that's why you're on this call, because we do apologetics. So there you go, number 11, right there. It's already done this year. You got it right in front of you. See, that was funny. No, it wasn't. Um, so the point is that you can, you know, go through what you think you, you want to focus on this year, but a lot of this stuff's already been revealed in the scriptures, okay? So having said that, um, I'm going to go to talk time now, <clears throat> get off the screen, go back to me, and uh, we can start talking about some of these issues. So um, I gave us plenty of discussion time. So how about that? Who wants to talk? Go ahead. Unmute yourself. Or do I have to unmute you? Let me unmute. Anyone want to talk first? Yeah, I'd like to talk first. Okay, right. John, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good to see you again. Yeah, good seeing you. Happy New Year. Same to you. I loved your message. Um, I personally, um, that last one you said, 11, that's why I'm here. Why, that's why I come here is for apologetics. Okay. And I got that. But that whole that whole thing you gave tonight, it was, um, I work with, um, I work at, I have a, I'm working with the prison ministry. And I work in a recovery ministry. And um, needs to say, I see, I hear all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I'm going to, hold on a minute, John. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Give me a second. John, I'm going to unmute you. Just a second. That didn't work. And, um, there you are. Okay. Hmm. Trying to unmute you. Well, not unmute you. Interesting. There. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Okay, John, okay. go ahead. So listen to this tonight to even even I was I had to choose between what was good and what was best. I have a group of men I meet with every Tuesday night. And I finally made a decision, no, I'm going to apologetics because that's where you think <laughs> Okay. And I had to make a decision because there's a group of men that I work with all the time in the ministry. Okay. And so but just anyway, that's beside the point. But um, so you're disappointed. I didn't do something apologetic tonight, right? I was so. just, yeah, I'm just, I had to, I had to put you off for a couple of weeks and I said, no, I can't do this anymore. I was listening on YouTube. I was thankful for that. Okay. But I like to, but I like to hear the live responses that you get. And you don't do that. I don't get that on YouTube. So, by the being said, but being working with, with drug addicts and, uh, we do we, 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 well i say that they're not drug addicts they're, they're believers in jesus christ they struggle with uh, sexual sexual integrity drug, yeah, addi addictions right yeah all kinds of addictions and and i talked to the guy today in prison you know i was talking to the guy you know he's in there for wrong arm robberies 
confesses to be a Christian. And I just had to get blunt with him. I said, you know, you're here today and you may be, you may be spending five to 10 years in prison. And I said, you've lost everything but God. You ever lost everything but Jesus Christ. So he's got your attention now and you need to start. So I have to direct him how to read his Bible. You know, he says, I'm in Genesis. I said, no, start with John, read John, read Acts, read Romans, then we'll talk. You know, to go through it, to, you know, get the principles, you know, the, they, when I talk to these guys, they, they come to you and they expect God to deliver them from their consequences. I said, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the problems that God can't work in your life. He can use you. Now he's got your attention. He's got your attention now. And um, one of the guys I work with in prison ministry spent 17 years in prison. Mm hmm and so now he's he and we work with him and he does a lot of mentoring and um, and he gets this all the time so it's a pleasure working with him but to have that on site but me being an ex drug addict and in and, and, and prison and all that and uh, so i can relate to him i know where they're coming from but it's um, when i listen to this about the will of god you know i i like that because i hear that all the time you know what is the will of god for me and I said it's written just read the scriptures yeah and right right it. yeah yeah it's, sometimes it's to make it harder it needs to be i mean some of the like you said the moral will of god it's already revealed 100 mm -hmm. percent. right right good points so i agree right. but listening to you tonight was great because you give me points that i can use you know that i can say you know go through this you know i hear the things there about the perfect wife you know i hear all that stuff so yeah Absolutely. I'm so, so I'm so thankful to hear you tonight. It just really shares me. It gives me more confidence in what I'm doing. So thank I you. want to mention something, John. Um, I did a just real quickly with apologetics and prison ministry. I did a presentation once in a prison about five years ago um, on a, on God's existence. And I'll tell you what I found out speaking to prisoners. Now I'm used to college students, but I, I found out something. They have a lot of time to read. <laughs> and so yes, they, they I, uh, I really could not believe the questions they had afterwards. Some of them were atheists and they were really, really, you know, they wanted to argue, you know, they were ready. And um, I'll tell you, they, um, they really knew what they wanted to ask. And, um, you know, I'd say I got a lot of atheists. At that. I mean, there were Christians there too, but there are definitely right. some atheists and some hardened skeptics, you know what I mean? So yes. it, was, it was very interesting. <laughs> they get very they, in prison when they spend time in prison. Like they, they get to they, it's called uh, uh, jailhouse Christianity or jailhouse religion. They, right. they 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 know the word. They don't know the word just as well as you do. Not believe a, a word of it. They have no trust in the Lord. You know they they right. won't. They're not interested in the more. They're more in, interested in debating with you. And that's what they study it for. Well, that's what they came to do that night. That was fun. I mean, it was interesting too. <laughs> but thanks for your comments. I agree 100%. But I'm glad, like I said, we'll get back to apologetics for sure next week, though. Back to like uh, and, regular. And, uh, the one thing I have a request don't stop doing Zoom. I live in Florida, and this is such a blessing. So if you start doing it on oh, campus, good. no good for me. Oh, well, we're still on campus. Like I said, we just can't meet in the classroom so you know like i said we can't do that because of covid we can still go there we just we have some restrictions but anyway so we'll be doing this for a while yeah i encourage my friends all the time to come over you know to join me well good and, i'm glad so, glad to glad to hear you and i'm glad i'd rather be in florida i admit it it's cloudy and cold in ohio but anyway um, yes it's beautiful down here yeah don't rub it in um anyway it's 70 degrees i had to wear a jacket today yeah anyway okay all right thanks but uh, thanks for coming, though. Anybody but, uh, else have any other comments or thoughts uh, on tonight's topic? I, I kind of wanted to say one thing. Yes, um, sir. Who's this? No, I'm sorry. It's, it's, Cam. it's Cam. No, it's Cam. Oh, why do you have your mask on? Uh, I'm still at work. I was about to say, I was like, there's no excuse that you can't make it because I literally am at work till 10, and I still made it. <laughs> okay. You look good with that mask. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just like in the bathroom? Yeah, I'm hiding in the bathroom because I'm taking it's a picture. great. You're in the bathroom. I love it. Go ahead. But then that's about it. I'm basically just saying there's no excuse to not make these Zoom calls because I'm literally doing my job and I'm still in it. I know. That's, well, that's good. all I have. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. I'll be seeing you Thursday. 
Um, but good. Yeah, that's my, by the way, Cameron is at near campus, so I see him all the time. Anybody else have any other comments, thoughts? Yes, I do have a question. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, uh, it's a very good topic today and many things clear to me today like i am feeling feeling a freedom like the likes of like you told that not for every single thing we have to pray so god have given us a free will already but my question is that uh, my parents they are non-believers uh -huh. yeah so i am praying for them basically and so far i shared gospel with them but it's not easy for them to accept so but still I'm praying and uh, uh, my question basically is that I want to share some testimonies with them or to sometime I feel that I should share and send them some more uh, information about uh, gospel and all. But I'm scared that sometimes I, I, I feel that no, I should not maybe turned into their more anger or something wrong turned out. So I'm praying that I pray sometimes that Lord, should I do this? Should I take this step? or not and guide me what should i do what should i what should not i not do yeah so, well that's, that's fine kind of i don't fear. yeah i think that's fine i didn't like i said i said you can pray through everything i just saying you know what i mean it's not like you're not including god in the process i'm not saying that i'm talking about where you come to those big decisions where mm -hmm. you just don't know what to do anymore and, you, and you're not violating a moral principle and sometimes mm -hmm. you just have to make a decision but you know yeah i mean there's nothing wrong with praying about yeah, this is relate to family members and yeah, you know, praying for wisdom and discernment and things. I, yeah. I do that with my family all the time. I say, Lord, give me wisdom how to handle my elderly parents, right? Exactly. Yeah. Stuff like that. I mean, obviously. Now I will say if you're dealing with parents that are unbelievers or family members, that's the hardest mission field there is. Yeah, that's and right. so in many cases you need to just pray, be praying a lot for them. Pray more. Your your prayers will probably impact them more than Amen. your Amen. your words and everything. I, my parents just got burnt out from me talking about it years ago, so I just yeah. stopped talking. They I know see. what I believe. I've explained it to them. You know. I know. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I I feel like that in between <laughs> so that okay then it's fine. Let it be like uh, in God's timing, in God's will. Let it be in His will to be done. That when that time come will will come. So. Is it okay or I, like you said that I, as I'm already praying, so I should keep praying? Yeah, I mean, that's all you can do if they don't know, if they don't believe. I mean, all you can do is keep praying about it and pray God would send people in their lives to talk to them. That's yeah. what I pray a lot of times that God send other people. You know what I mean? Because so, sometimes mm -hmm. they won't listen to you, right? Yeah. You know, you're better off praying that. And so, yeah, that's all you can do. And that's all God can, you know, ask you to do really, yeah. right? Can't make anyone. Yeah, I'm scared anything. to send them a some like a testimonies and also that they might get anger or something like that so um that's what i was they yeah. could they could i mean they could they could get angry and family members do get there's uh, sometimes the, jesus said you know that families he has to be first above mm -hmm. your family and yeah it's going to be cost it's going to be costly i mean sometimes your family misunderstand you exactly um, i've had experiences where my family misunderstood me Oh yes, yeah. the way it goes. That's 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 the cost of following the Lord, and that's the way it's always. Yeah, been. yeah. Because I'm already like experiencing this thing because uh, when I'm sending my messages on the WhatsApp or something, so my dad is not easily opening. He's very scared when he saw that oh something is coming up from her. So for many days he's not opening my messages. So that's why i want to share with this yeah it, you're just that's gonna happen i mean so just keep following <laughs> yeah. the lord stay close to him love them unconditionally and pray for them that's all you can yeah. do okay thank you so much absolutely okay <laughs> anybody else Thanks. anybody else want to talk do you want to talk about how awesome they are to have the new year in front of them okay, go ahead. Hey, uh, i've got different people sam go ahead i i have a comment you do? Why? A, I'm just kidding. It's a regarding applying wisdom. Okay. Uh, one time I went to church with a new believer. She's dating a non-believer. Yeah. So she went up, she and I went up to talk to Rich Nathan after the service. With a missionary. Rich Nathan is a senior pastor of uh, Vignette, Columbus. Yeah. And Rich Nathan said, well, it depends on what kind. I think he, he gave a very good response. He said, well, that's your decision, but I give you a, a word of you know something to hang on to is depends on what kind of what kind of christian are you 
if you are a great food Christian, crisis in one section of your life, like a piece of great food, you know, different section. Yeah, all things are possible. But if, if you are a, a glass of milk and Jesus come into your life like a, a chocolate syrup, pour into a chocolate, become chocolate milk, that would become impossible. So it all depends on what kind of Christian you really are. And then he leave it as that. That person oh, is a Christian. Yeah. Hey, what kind of Christian I am uh, with this relationship? Do I have problem with this relationship? I think it seems to be a pretty wise uh, counsel. Yeah, well, you know, missionary dating is popular sometimes where they assume that, you know, you can date and win the person over the Lord. You know, people people done that. Um, many cases it doesn't work. Um, but, you know, I don't really, I just think that that's, uh, if someone comes to me and says, you think it's wise I date this person, they don't believe it, I, I would say my first thing is no, I don't. But <laughs> obviously, if you're going to do what you're going to do, go do it. But I mean, I can't make you do anything. But I don't think it's wise, assuming that you can win them over to the faith. You know what I mean? Because you're going to yeah. just like be a great witness. It could happen, but it's just it's just risky you know what i mean and yeah. so you know I, i'm not be trying to be legalistic about it it's just something that i think is very very risky yeah. well i think the wisdom here he is not talking about your relationship he is talking about your relationship with christ yeah if your relationship with great food then yeah everything's fine christ is only part of your life there's a little section i know what he's saying right Right. Yeah, but if, uh, if Jesus is the chocolate syrup onto your glass of milk. Right, you just add, kind of like he's just life. an add-on, you mean, like an add-on, just add it in. No, it's a chocolate, you become chocolate milk. Yeah, you become, right. right. And he I said, see. if you are a chocolate milk Christian, <laughs> then okay. it would be impossible, he said. So, it's just but I don't know what it's kind a good of, analogy. Yeah, but he said, but I don't know what kind of Christian you are, so you have to decide for yourself. Okay. Basically, he's asking you, what kind of Christian you aspire to be? Right. Or you want to stay as a, a, a you know, grapefruit Christian, or you aspire to be a chocolate milk Christian? That's the decision. Well, I'll have to keep that in mind for the future, for that little analogy there. I'll have to keep I think it's very smart, because he doesn't even talk about your relationship with that guy. Right. <laughs> the other person. He focuses it back on where it needs to be, right. Yeah, and between okay. you and you and Christ. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's a good point. I was just going to add to that. So when you were oh, good. When, <laughs> so when you are chocolate milk, you milk, you cannot separate any of those pieces anymore because he is, you know, he enmeshes everything that you are with it, your relationship with the Lord. And, yeah. And I would yeah, tell I, um, anybody that missionary dating does not work. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen some people where they did date someone that was not a believer and the person did come into the faith and they got married um i've seen the complete opposite where it did not work um it was a disaster um it's just i would say off the top of my head i see my first response if someone comes to me and asks me what what i think they should do i'd say i just don't think it's a good idea i mean i just don't don't i mean that's my conviction i think it's a bad idea so, I like how you said it's risky, Eric. You're risky. Right. risky. It is risky. I mean, I've had, you know, we've had a couple of people in our congregation that um, married someone not in the faith. Um, and they brought the, for example, we have Jews and Gentiles. We're like, we have a, a Gentile person marry a Jewish uh, uh, husband, you know, Gentile Christian woman. But she wasn't really that committed to her faith when she got married, maybe. You know what I mean? Kind of just. And then she got married, and now she doesn't know what to do. Well, now she wants to get committed to her faith. Now, she, but now she's got the husband who doesn't believe. So they, um, they, you know, they go on this journey for five or six, eight years where they're not believing the same things. And then they bring they bring them to our congregation. Of course, we're we have a Jewish, you know, we're Jew focused on that. And a couple of them have come to faith. You know what I mean? But that's very, and I can tell you other stories where it didn't work out that way. You know what I mean? Where it went the opposite way. And so it's just, it's just very risky, I think. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, Eric, in that, I have an excellent example. 
And I, I know a lady, she's a very devout, she, she has the calling to go overseas mission, but then she get into a, a missionary dating <laughs> and, and he became a young believer and they, they eventually get married pretty quickly. But that calling for her to go overseas mission, God has keep pushing on that button. So mm -hmm. she finally want to do it, but that guy have a different idea. He is, he want a sweet, homely wife for his kid, you know, which is not a bad thing. So they have a completely different idea what a marriage is supposed to be. So he's thinking about long-term overseas mission, and he's thinking about a home sweet home, a homemaker sweet wife. So yeah, I mean, about 18 months. Yeah. yeah, different callings. It just, it leads to all kinds of issues, different purpose, yeah. different calling. Yeah, it's challenging. It, it really is. Um, okay, anybody else? Eric, I was going to share something. You were. <laughs> Surprise. Good grief. Talk about it being Sorry. in the car. Sorry. I've got I'll my new studio. Did everyone see my new studio? It's cool, isn't it? Who cares? Anyway, go ahead. Um, uh, I was just going to say I'm glad that you shared that uh, sometimes God does lead specifically. Uh, of course, we have a lot of options on a daily basis and stuff, but I was just um, remembering there was a time when my late husband and I lived in Phoenix and our um, Phoenix pastor was going to be heading back to Cherry Hill, New Jersey to plant a church. And there were a group of us that um, were considering going along with him as church planters. And we just felt this really strong no in our spirit. And it was almost like I felt a spirit of rejection because it's like, how come everyone else gets to go and God's telling us no? Why can't we be a part of this new work? And at the end of the day, um, the pastor who led the group ended up getting a divorce and uh, I don't think the church ever really got off the ground. It was just a nightmare. And, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. it, it seemed like it was God's protection. And so, mm -hmm. and, and I've, um, I've recently had a similar experience with thinking about removing Nathan from the school program that he's in. And I just felt a really sick feeling about it. Um, and, and I do think that God does, um, he can lead very specifically, sometimes a very sharp no, you know. Um, and, the, you know, I remember when we, we had discussed this, topic in our, um, our our meeting at at Anderson and we're talking about the Blackaby book the experiencing God book or whatever and um, I, I really like a lot of the stories in that book where people stepped out in faith not seeing you know not seeing how their call would materialize and how it did materialize and I just noticed that uh, Henry and Richard Blackaby and Claude King are have all remained faithful well into their latter years Mm -hmm. um, and that really encourages me because the older I get, the more I look at that as guys who have walked the walk and talked the talk faithfully, you know? And so I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Let me show you one thing here. I think I have it on the slide here. I just want to mention something since you brought up that book. Um, so this one right here to the right, see on the far right, how should we choose on the far right? That book was interesting because if you look at the top, look at the contributors. Henry and Richard Blackaby, Gary Friesen, and Gordon T. Smith. So you've got three guys from these line of books here. See the middle one, Knowing God's Will Smith. And you've got Friesen in the other one right here, Gary Friesen. And then you've got Blackaby all in one book talking about um, their views on decision making. So that's a fascinating book because you get their different perspectives. Now, they obviously don't all agree, right, on some things. Some things they do, some things they don't. So it's just kind of interesting, you know, that that book was a discussion between them about that that issue. So um, having said, and I read it like six years ago, I'd have to go back and read again. Um, having said that, yeah, like I said in that one slide, I, I said God can definitely guide us specifically if he wants to. He can do whatever he wants to do. I and mean, just today, I'll give you an example. So this is interesting. So we were looking at a house early this morning. Um, I, we looked at it and I was walking around and I'm thinking, yeah, I liked it. I mean, I liked the, the way it looked. And, and so suddenly I thought that God was like somehow maybe speaking to me like, and it's like, yes, this is the right house. Like, yes. But then we drove away and we talked about it as a family and that they're a realtor. And then there was a whole bunch of no's. Like, this is what's wrong with it. This isn't the right. This is why this isn't a good choice. And this is some practical issues. And so I say to myself, hmm, maybe that was my flesh. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. You know what I mean? So 
it, he can guide, but it just is like I said, it just becomes very tricky sometimes. You know what I mean? In discerning. And I, I do believe God can definitely step in at any point in your life and guide you any way he wants. He can do whatever he wants to do. God's not limited. But um, as I said, I think in some cases he will do that. And in many cases he won't. I think it's kind of like a both and, you know what I mean? But I always, yeah, I've always told the Lord, you know, guide me any way you want. If you want to, you know, I pray for wisdom, ever the wisdom comes, you know, ever you want to do it. But the thing is, though, in many cases, as I've matured in my Christian life, I think that he's shown me, it's just, as the years have gone by, it's like, you need to make the choice. You need to make it. Like, I've given you your mind, I, you're gathering information, you're praying about it. It's not out of my moral will. So make the choice. And so that I'm not saying everything. I'm saying a lot of times as time's gone on. Now, early in my years as a new Christian, I saw a lot more very, 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 very him hands on on a lot of things. But I think as time went on, he wanted, I, I got at it. I just, I think it was part of just maturing is in my decision making. And I don't mind it because I think I could see him doing that. I, I, show, I saw a point in my life where it, it changed, where He's beginning to show me like I, you need to start like i'm not saying i'm not there but make decisions you know what i mean like i can't tell you what to do every single time like you've got to know every it just you're never gonna make any choices and a lot of times you know when he we wanted to make the choices it's like like as i said before we don't have to think anymore he made the choice for us there see we don't we don't have to think about it god made the choice there it's done it's over so um, it was great because I liked it at the beginning. I was thinking like, great, this is great. He just shows me what to do and I don't have to even think anymore. You know, but then after time, I realized that that was, that was not going to be happening. And so, you know, but like I said, he still can guide you any way he wants specifically. And um, it's just weird that happened today to me. I was like, yeah, okay. I'm thinking, I think God's leading us to this house. This is a great. And then suddenly I was like, we're like, God, that's, that won't work. <laughs> like, yeah, you know I mean, maybe it's what I wanted, and that was my flesh speaking. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. It just gets kind of tricky. Oh, Eric, yeah, anyway, so go ahead. Yes, yeah, Sam. On on that hearing the voice of God on that matter. Well, I go to Vineyard. It's charismatic. I know. And they actually they actually have classes on how to listen to to the voice of God. Okay. Right. I know. And 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 you would get together, and then you could. There's some people. Oh, I heard something about you, and they would describe me, which is say. Wow, it is me. So they they actually do hear something. You have to confirm it because that person have never even we never met that person before. Mm -hmm. okay, but there is a caveat. Even they teach that way, but they said if you hear something about something significant about you know job or about you know moving or about whatever you know about your family or who you're going to be married, do at least have two or three other source of confirmation your small group people that know you well uh, your pastor of course it has to be nothing contradict the bible you know and sometimes those things may be if you are not a a believer that well works in the in the word you go you you need to go to a pastor so they don't just say oh you heard something go ahead you know even even they encourage you to go and listen to God that direction. They yeah. want that message being confirmed by at least two or three sources before you act before you execute it. So yeah, I think they're getting that off that Deuteronomy passage that uh yeah. everything is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Um yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean I for me I don't I don't see well, confirmation. Basically he whatever. he practiced your <laughs> list. You see what I mean? That the list you you put out earlier. Yeah. Which Basically, one was it? you go through that list, and there is three or four of those meet the criteria. Oh, oh, that's right. The traditional view, like the the yeah, the traditional well, you, view I had. Yeah, you're supposed to go to your your pastor, not not a pastor who doesn't know you. Yeah. Someone, no, someone I'd agree who, with that. Yeah, and and your small group, they know you. You know. Yeah. So. If the, what I'm trying to say, even though they were so charismatic, they still want you to practice this kind of caution. You know, don't just jump on it when, when you hear something. Right. You talking about this one, this list right here, like the traditional yes, view? Yes, exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah, line, they, they line up with one and two, one, two, and three, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I think a lot of times, in all honesty, our decision making is, is circumstantial. Um, yeah. I think for most of us, you know, circumstances aren't there. It's like, what do you, you know, I just, this just ha is what I have to do. Like the circumstances dictate what I have to do. Let's say you need a job and you, you know, you interview three places and the place offers you a job and you have to make a living. Like you don't have another month to wait. You don't like, like, you know, that's the circumstance, right? You yeah. know what I mean? And then sometimes that's just the way it is. And so we don't have time to wait for God's voice or time to wait for people to confirm it. It's like sometimes just circumstances are just pressing in on us. You know what I mean? Yeah. We just don't have time. And so I, I, I think that's where a lot of times we make our decisions. You know what I mean? It's just circumstances dictate where it's going. And um, it's the way life is sometimes, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah, I know what their model is there. I know what it is. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Any I was just going to add, as, as I remember, Timothy Keller, who's the, pe the, the preacher in, yeah. uh, in uh, New York. Yeah. I think there were a lot of people that were asking whether he had a confirmation before he actually, he and his family uprooted to go to New York to open up um, a church. And yeah. he said, like, not really. Uh, but then you can see all the fruit that's come from his decision in moving there. So I just thought it was interesting because a lot of people, they make the move because they say that they hear. And in this case, he said, no, I didn't. I, he just, I think he just felt maybe the nudge, I, I don't know, but I thought no, it was good that, never, that you don't I've necessarily, I, ju I just thought it was a good way, a, a, just an alternative perspective as far as, you know, you don't necessarily well, have to hear this voice. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying when you look at those books I post. I mean, people have different views of, you know, how to make decisions, and that's why people write those books. It's, it's interesting, you know what I mean? You actually have to write books about it now, but there's so many more I could have posted, but um, it's obviously that they've seen Christians struggle with this issue, you know, and they've, they've counseled people and seen things happen. I mean, Gary Friesen, I know he's counseled many people. I'm sure the Blackabees have and sure others have, but, um, I don't believe that you can give a perfect formula on decision-making. It works for every person because God knows you better than you know yourself. He, he knows how to, if you need to be guided a certain way, he can do whatever he wants to get through to you if he wants to right? And I'm not you and you're not me, okay? And so if he wants you to know something, he can make it clear, but in some cases he may not need to do, you know, do it that, that way with somebody else, you know what I mean? So that's the one thing, just to, just to, I'll turn to what Carla was saying, I, I, I didn't, I kind of, there's a lot of good things in the Black of book about getting a close relationship with God, but I don't like I didn't like the formula they gave because I just know that does not work for everybody. It doesn't. It's too formulatic. It's like if this happened, you got this, 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 and this, and boom, you found it. And that's one of the criticisms that, that was given to them that it's just most Christian lives that just doesn't happen. It may work in their lives, but it doesn't line up with other people's Christian lives. Um, I'm not saying they're not godly and they've done a lot of good things. I'm just saying realistically it just wasn't realistic for a lot of people um and so um you know people have different alternatives of how to make decisions um but the one thing i'm concerned about like i said i just think that a lot of times we're just crippled in our decision making you know what i mean we're just um we can't make any decisions because we you know we're just afraid you know fearful as can be um and that's a bad place to be anybody else Yes. Answer question. Violet. Yes. You're yeah. in Arizona. God bless you. <laughs> right. You are in the center of God's will. Right. Yeah. Seventy degrees right now. It's You're wonderful. definitely in the center of God's will. Go ahead. Uh, and I like what you said because a lot of times it's just stepping out on faith. Right. I mean, when I was a new believer, and I thought, and people would say, I was really intimidated when people would say, "Well, God told me this, and God told me that, and He said this," and I thought, "Am I not spiritual enough? Is God not yes, telling me? I know. How come right. I don't hear God's voice?" You know, right, right. But after right. forty plus years of ministry, I realized that, of course, God does show us His will through His Word. It may not be a definitive to our circumstance, but you know, it undergirds us so that we can step out on faith. 
We right. prayed about it. We prayed about it. And we just step out on faith and pray that, you know, God will bless it or not. Right. You know, and sometimes you step out in faith and God may step in to show you this isn't the right direction, you know? You exactly. Step, exactly. Step out and you said, this is the direction we're going. If God... Yeah. Yeah. If God's going to stop us, if he wants to give us some some sort of warning or something, he can do that. He can do whatever he wants to do. But it's just that, you know, this thing of trying to fit God into, he has to work this way and this guidance method perfectly, it just gets really dicey. You know what I mean? And trying to find a perfect guidance method to fit God right. in. Um, you know, the scriptures, remember, let's remember this, back in the uh, the, the Torah, you know, God spoke to, is, some people find this very weird, um, especially if you're not a believer. You know, God was speaking to them directly all the time. Abraham, Moses, others, you know, directly, like, I don't know how that looks like. Is he audibly speaking to them? I have no idea. But then he gives us a text, right? Now we have a text. He doesn't need to do that because he's, that's why we get a text, okay? Now people will say, well, that's just not, you're limiting God. God speaks the same way he's always spoken all throughout the scriptures. Well, could he speak audibly? I'm sure he can. He can do whatever he wants to do. But remember, he gave us a text. Now we have a text. And that is the main way he communicates. Okay? So when I'm reading the text, when I go tonight to read the text, I'm believing by faith that God is speaking through this text. This is him communicating. I don't, you know what I mean? That's the main way he communicates. So, but that's, you know, if you get talk like John MacArthur, some of these guys that just are, te I'm talking about hypertext only, they're against any kind of guidance outside the text. Like there is no guidance outside the text and you're in dangerous ground if you're seeking voices and subjective impressions and they think it's just whacked. I mean, they think it's dangerous and they think it's uh, esoteric. And uh, I'm not quite to that extreme, but I'm saying I'm, I'm not. I know I'm not, but I do believe that God primarily speaks through the text. Primarily, that's the main way He speaks. So anyway, and that's why preaching is so important. So, anyway, anybody else? Uh, yeah, Eric, I thank you for this. This has definitely been enlightening, encouraging. Well, oh, happy New Year to you, Charles. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, oh, but um, one of the things I was thinking about, you know, as as has been discussing one a, a lot of these topics, I'm, I'm just thinking about the whole encounter when uh when Jesus went went and sat with with Mary and Martha, and, and one was in the kitchen cooking, the other one was sitting at his feet, and uh, uh I'm I, I always gonna mix up, so if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it was Mary that was cooking and Martha that sat at his feet. Right. And Mary got upset because Martha. Why don't you? Why don't you tell her to come help me? And and he doesn't rebuke her in a sense, like in telling Mary that she was doing something wrong. So yeah. He just, you know, he yeah. points out that Martha made a a different choice, a better choice. And sometimes, and I think about some of that when it comes down to decision making. That sometimes it's not that we are choosing bad or you know bad or good. Sometimes it's something that's good and something that might be better. Sometimes it's just things that are good and good. And we, we have to be able to make a, a, a strong decision and a choice. And I think just sometimes one of the things um, that makes it difficult is that fear of failure or just right. that one to just wanting to succeed. Um, but just even the other day, I was just looking at the beginning of Matthew again and just looked at in Matthew chapter four, right after Jesus is baptized. And then you hear God the Father is saying, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And then the next thing that is written is that he was led into the wilderness by the spirit. You know, like he was led into this, into the wilderness to be tempted. As right. Matthew records it. And just right. being able to know and realize that even when we are spiritually led, sometimes we will walk into, in, into dangerous situations. Isn't that uh, the principle behind, um, even in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, I shall, I shall fear no evil. Um, it, uh, this whole precept is based off the whole first line that the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, I mean, like, well, I was saying that in a couple of the slides that just because you're in difficulty doesn't mean that you're out of God's will. Um, you know, just because you're in trial or having a trial, right? So, mm -hmm. th yeah, I mean, God can lead us into situations, not necessarily he's going to lead us to sin, but he can lead us 
you know, into situations that may be difficult, you know, and sometimes we just think that, well, then that's, that's not God's will because all God's goal is my life just to be happy and prosperous. You know what I mean? And that's right. It. And because, and, and uh, I uh, was listening a little bit when, uh, um, when the guy was giving his testimony about the work that he does within the prison ministry and right. that prison ministry, that is, you know, that's just like one of the things. And even for us here and, um, in society, when we evangelize and we witness to someone, there's this false pretense that we come to Jesus and then everything, everything, every all the wrongs are righted. You know, oh, now all of a sudden, the, all these, uh, all this evidence they had against me done disappeared and oh, they done changed the law and now I'm going to be set free. And we even think about that even, you know, even for myself, you know, coming to Christ. It was some of those things I have to wrestle myself through and realize that you know what? My salvation actually brought me to the doorstep of having to deal with some of the worst, some of my worst temptations and some of the worst things about me and being able to overcome those things and be able to make strong and positive decisions. Um, oh, but, yeah. I, yeah, I would never say to anybody, if you want to become a follower of Jesus, that if you think it's going to be easy, um, you know, that's an easy life. I mean, you know, you're, you're picking the wrong thing. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's not, <laughs> oh, yeah. that's not our message. So, um, you know, I grew up with a line that used to always say, if you're scared, go to church. And I've come to grow up and then came to church. Um, don't come to church if you're scared. <laughs> you're going to have to have some things you're going to have to deal with when you come to church. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's a cost to follow the Lord. I mean, it's, you, have to you have to weigh the commitment, right? That's what Jesus did with his notice in the Gospels. He said, count the cost, right? If you really want to mm -hmm. follow me. And so it's costly. Um, absolutely. Um, anybody else? Maybe a couple. I just thank you. Um, I'll just say, I'll just thank you for taking this time out, especially at the beginning of the year of realigning ourselves. That is actually one of the studies that um, that I want to do throughout this year myself personally. Um, is is that as a study based off of what pleases God, what pleases God? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we wake up. You know, you start the new year. I think all of us have mixed emotions. You know, I think some of us are like, yeah, it's a new year, it's a new year to really, for change, I'm excited, you know what I mean? A new year, you know, and then some of us are like, ah, another year, like what, you know, like I'm kind of like, what do I want to do this year? Oh, what's different than last year? I mean, and you know, we, everybody has different emotions, different goals, and um, you know, God's goals for us hasn't cha haven't changed, they don't change year to year. I mean, as far as like scripturally speaking, so. Um, Anyway, maybe he, you know, he definitely got, you know, may, there may be something that happens in your life this year is different from last year. I'm not saying that can't happen. I'm just saying mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the same things have already been laid out in scripture year after year. It's the same thing. Uh, anybody yeah. else? Anybody? I'd like to give a praise report. Okay. About making choices. Okay. I have a daughter. I have, a, I have two daughters and one daughter and, um, and they're both Messianic Jews. My okay. first wife, my first wife was Jewish. My second wife, I came to know the Lord. But that being said, my first wife, my my daughter, my my youngest daughter, had a very rebellious set of kid. But anyway, she she ended up with five kids. She got four boys and one girl from her first husband, and um, and she didn't want to put them in public school because she didn't like public school. And every year she had another kid and she started going to school and doing every year they struggled and had to pray about it and then god never gave him an answer but he just kept doing that she every year it was a struggle do we want to go back to school it's a lot of work travel transfers this went on for 17 years so the uh so they came to one of the one of the boys finally got and also they're all in sports so one of the boys got a um was the got a scholar, not a scholarship, but a reward for being one of the finest athletes in the country. And so uh, schools can't draft kids. They have to give them, you have to come in on scholarships. So they, um, so they had several schools offer the scholarships to come in if they passed the academics. So to make a long story short, they took the first boy. She went through three or four schools and the prep schools that offered her. And so she went to the, she went to the, so finally decided they chose American Heritage. So they started to do the interviews. 
So they brought the kids in and did the scholastics. They did so well on them, they started questioning my daughter. Said, what did you do here? He says, they're amazing. And, she's, and, and she says, well, and she started talking. Now they offered the one boy a scholarship. She's got five kids, right? Mm -hmm. So she's got five, she's got five kids, they offered the one the scholarship. They interviewed her, they started, they interviewed the, her, the boy first, and then they started interviewing her, what did you do? She says, because they would do stuff like, they didn't do summaries on, on the, like the constitution, she made them read the constitution and the federal, the federal statements, that's the kind of stuff they did. So they did all real well, so they did well, and they turn around and offer her a job. Says, we'll give you a job. We'll put all our kids, all your kids, through, and you, all your kids can have scholarships. All your kids will give them scholarships to come to school. That's five kids. That's 150000 a year. Wow. Plus wow. a job. Because they were so impressed with her abilities and what she did. And here she was struggling every year. Am I doing the right thing? And then she's, you know, taking care of the house. You got kids. You got to. I mean, her and her husband is great too. Now, don't get me wrong; they're they're both great. That's what the boys got. But that was, but she never heard. She, she when I talked to her about it every year, so I just believe that this is the right thing to do. I just got that feeling. She made it. I mean, she didn't get no loud voices. She just, and that's the way I am too. I just get that peace all of a sudden. Okay, I'm doing the right thing. This this is the choice I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. But. But that's the that's the providence of God. That to me is the providence of God working. That's how He works things out. Yeah, yeah. And it's the providence, you know. Here you're struggling, and um, now they had to face all this prep school stuff because at one point they have to go to prep school to get prepared to go to college. So.